Old Style, an official sponsor of the Chicago Cubs, is proud to present this exciting new home video, The Boys of Zimmer. Since the first day we brewed Old Style beer, we've always had one goal, to be the best. That's why we still brew Old Style with only the purest artesian spring water, and why we still use the slow method of double brewing, called croisoning, the most natural way to brew beer, and the most expensive. There may be faster ways to brew beer, but at Old Style, our dream is not to be the biggest beer in America, just the best. Reach for the best. Dreams and memories reside in this place. And after 75 years of playing baseball here, some of those memories still ring off the red brick and tumble from the ivy. Attention, please. Have your pencil and scorecards ready, and I'll give you the correct lineup for today's ball game. The battery for the Cubs, Bush and Hartman. Fastball swung on, that baby is hit hard, right way up, way back. Home run for Billy. He throws one into the right field bleachers. Boy, did he kiss it. He swings and a drive. Liner left field. It is. There it is. Mr. Banks has just hit his 500th career homer. He is getting a standing ovation. In 1989, a new dream came to life at Wrigley Field. Spring always brings fresh hope, but this year it also brought thorns of controversy. The talented young Rafael Palmero had been traded to Texas in a much maligned deal that brought pitcher Paul Gilgis and reliever Mitch Williams to the Cubs, along with rookie pitcher Steve Wilson. The team wasn't going to stand pat with last year's fourth place finishers. Well, I still feel we have holes. We uh, have, uh, uh, well, we don't have, I'm sorry, depth on the bench. Uh, we don't have uh, a lot of power throughout the lineup. And I think there's still some question marks about the starting pitcher. Uh, I really don't know what management thinking is at this particular time. Uh, I do think that uh, Jim Fry probably sit down and evaluate the situation in spring training and uh, try to come up with a few more players. The Cubs were certainly strong at several positions. Second baseman Ryan Sandberg was back for his eighth season, and Sean Dunstan was staking a claim as one of the outstanding shortstops in the National League. The pitching situation was still up in the air, and the team didn't win many exhibition games. Don Zimmer took his team north, unsettled and uncertain. On April 4th, the Chicago Cubs presented themselves for the start of the 75th season of baseball at Wrigley Field. Fans in and out of the ballpark would witness a remarkable debut that day when Zimmer called for his new left-handed relief pitcher in the eighth inning. And so Mitch Williams took center stage at Wrigley Field for the first time. It was Mitch who had been the key to the Palmero trade, and all eyes were on the new reliever. In the ninth, he loaded the bases with no outs, then righted himself as he struck out Mike Schmidt for the first out of the inning. When he got Chris James swinging, the stage was set for a dramatic conclusion against the Phillies' Mark Ryle. He's the man that had to make the Texas trade. He was the boss. He okayed it. 
He just got raked over the coals. There's no question about it. We thought we made a good trade when we made it. And, of course, today we don't hear too much about it. All Mitch Williams did was go out and record six saves in the Cubs' first ten games. And he became a formidable new character on the team. Say something, Drew. Uh, Mitch, you is very crazy, dude. He said, Mitch, you're an outstanding individual. <laughs> this was a lefty in the classic southpaw mold. Unpredictable and a little off kilter. Cub fans immediately took to the man they called Wild Thing. Wild Thing? Uh 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 uh. You make my heart sing. Da 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 da. You make everything groovy. Wild Thing! I think I love you. <laughs> hey, go Wild Thing! While there was new and wild, there was also veteran and consistent. Rick Sutcliffe has been the anchor of the Cubs pitching staff for five years. You could almost feel the confidence he breathed into the team when he won his first four starts. The Cubs, too, got off to a quick start, winning eight of their first ten games. If the young Cubs needed to learn about winning, they would need the leadership of veterans like Sutcliffe and Andre Dawson. Dawson, like Sutcliffe, started fast, then tied a team record when he had eight consecutive hits. Then things started going bad. Things started going very bad. The early Cub Express suddenly faltered and ground to a virtual halt. Mistakes, misplays, and miscues cascaded into a late April losing streak that all but canceled out the team's strong start. Frustration replaced jubilation as they fell quickly from first to third. Then, as if to add injury to insult, May brought even worse news. All Cubs fans could do was read it and weep. And the bad news kept coming. Within a staggeringly short period of time, the entire starting outfield was felled by injury. Their prize rookie, Jerome Walton, joined Dawson and Webster on the DL. And suddenly, it was beginning to look like a long season. By May 15th, the Cubs were looking for help and to stop a five-game losing streak. Immediate help arrived that day when Lloyd McClendon stepped to the plate for his first Cub at bat. Now the pitch. There's a drive. Deep left field might be out of here. A three-run homer by Lloyd McClendon. Don Zimmer, a happy man. Don Zimmer's probably saying, Lloyd, where have you been all my life? Nice to have you on the ball club, and what a way to be welcomed on the club. You never know what might have happened. I know that I looked up and I had three outfielders playing regular for me, and within three days' time, they all three went on the disabled list. Not too many people talk about that, about of us having injuries, because we overcame it. Dwight Smith hit 370 for three weeks. McClendon hit 350 for three weeks. Desenzo caught everything that was hit out there, and we won. Now, what would have happened? If our three regulars hadn't got hurt, I don't know the answer to that. But I do know the guys that did come up from Iowa, they did a great job for us. And that's kind of been the, the thing that's happened to this ball club all year. What also happened this year was the emergence of pitcher Mike Bilecki. The journeyman right-hander established himself as a quality major league starter. And his surprising success buoyed a struggling team. We had a lot of uh, injuries on our ball club that could have really sank us. When we lost our whole outfield, we lost our, our main cog in our wheel and Andre Dawson, but 
we just didn't didn't let it uh, drag us down, and we went out there and, and kept battling. Uh, we got some guys that came up from uh, AAA and just did the job. We got a lot of guys that weren't expected to do as well as they have, myself included. I was never really that successful out in, at the major league level outside of this year. By late May, it seemed like some of the pieces to the puzzle were finally falling into place. Bush Stadium in St. Louis is enemy territory in spite of Cub infiltrators. But on June 4th, Sean Dunstan made himself right at home there when he blasted two home runs in an awesome display of Cub power. Mitch Webster, back off the disabled list, also hit a homer. And Ryan Sandberg belted two more. The Cubs hit a total of six home runs to set a Bush Stadium record. Additional fireworks were ignited when Mark Grace felt that Frank DePino was trying a little too hard to prevent more damage. In the ensuing scuffle, Grace suffered a separated shoulder. It would put him, too, on the disabled list. Cub bats continued to burn the next day back at the friendly confines. Rookie Dwight Smith hit his first Major League home run in a 15-3 rout of the New York Mets, who had been widely picked to coast to the division title. Three days later, Rick Rona provided the heroics with a 10th inning squeeze bunt that drove in Lloyd McClendon with a winning run. The Cubs took three of four games from the mighty Mets and extended their first place lead to three games. Once again, things were looking good for the Cubs and Don Zimmer. And people everywhere were starting to look at Don Zimmer and his surprising Cubs. The second year manager had the team scrambling and scrapping all year for runs and for outs. When general manager Jim Fry hired Zimmer a year ago, some said it was only because they were friends. I just happened to know Don Zimmer real well for a long time. But I know a lot of people for a long time. And they ain't going to manage the Cubs. I got him because he's a good manager, that's all. He led the team with enthusiasm and confidence and a daring style of play rarely associated with the Cubs. We squeeze bunt, we push bunt, we hit and run, we steal home. Vance out after this and swings and misses as the Cubs start the runner trying to steal home and they pull it off. Well, you just let us play, go out there and play hard. You know, you make a lot of money, so three hours of your time is not going to hurt, so why not give 100%? Dunstan singles in the center. Now he's going to go for two, and the throw is not in time. Don Zimmer makes you stay on your toes, believe me. There they go. Swung and struck out. Double steal. I just come out here and manage the way I want to manage. Uh, I can't worry what people say when I, when I do something unorthodox and it doesn't work. Naturally, there's criticism. He's so into the game and how things work that, that he will always explain it to you later and, and give you the whole rationale. Uh, and this year, uh, a lot more of his unorthodox moves have worked than have not worked. The only thing is, when I got something that strikes me, I'm going to do it. And uh, I can honestly say that I've done a lot of things on this club this year, but so far I haven't got a hit and I haven't pitched a ball this year. The players get the credit. I can call for a hit and run or a squeeze, but if the players don't execute it, nothing's going to work. And these guys have been awful good all year of executing the things that we wanted to do. Well, even if Zimmer had unleashed all that potential in the young Cubs, nobody is ever perfect, right? In mid-June, the Cubs came home after winning five straight games on the road, and they were, well, less than perfect. Look out! They got him! They lost six games in a six-game homestand against the Pirates and the Expos. And they fell out of first place for the first time in a month. They were beginning, some thought, to resemble some Cub teams of old. Wrigley Field has many pleasures, too. And one of them is the irrepressible broadcast voice of the Cubs, Harry Carey. 
And the sound of Harry is a popular tune around Wrigley Field. There's a drive. Holy cow. It might be out of here. It is. It's out of here. Way back. It might be. It could be. It is. It's out of here. Home run. Holy cow. Well, well, those aren't bad. But here's the real thing. From St. Louis to Oakland, to Chicago's South Side and North, the career of Harry Carey spans 45 years of Major League Baseball. And now Cooperstown, New York can also claim him. In July, he was given the Ford C. Frick Award and a place in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Yes, sir, baseball has given me many happy days and fine rewards. But this day, the day of receiving the Ford Frick Award, is the pinnacle, the zenith, the most important day of my baseball life. I feel honored and privileged today to be here with you. My wife, Dutchie, thanks you. Our children all thank you. And from the very, very bottom of my heart, I thank you. Thank you very much. And so he joined other immortals in that little town where baseball legends and treasures are kept. And in Chicago, there were many a hearty salute and fond hopes of hearing Cubs win many more times. In July, the Cubs did win, sometimes with late dramatic flair. On the 20th, they trailed the San Francisco Giants 3-0 in the bottom of the ninth with Steve Bedrosian pitching. But the Cubs had gotten two men on base, and with two out, Dwight Smith came to the plate. And the 0-2 is hitting the right field for a base hit. Now that Otto feels it on a hop, the throw comes through, and it's off man wearing his glove. And what that means is that the tying run goes to second. That then brought Kurt Wilkerson up to the plate. And the 0-2 to Wilkerson is hitting the left field. Sweet as it was to tie the game, it still hadn't been won or lost. In the 10th, Les Lancaster came on in relief and retired the heart of the Giants' batting order. But he wasn't done yet. With the score still tied in the 11th inning and Wilkerson on at first, Les did even more. And that's him. The Cubs were once again back to winning ways in a season that was beginning to resemble a roller coaster ride. The next day, Dwight Smith did a nice little transition from swinging to singing. Through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say. your heart out, Carmen Fanso. At the end of the month, the Mets came to town. And in a seesaw first game, threatened the Cubs' 6-5 ninth inning lead. There he goes! High fly ball! It's gonna drop, baby! Great catch! By Dutchman! Try for the double! Make it! Top to end! Top to end! Top to end! Holy cow! Dutchman made the play with the bat! After a 10-3 trouncing of the Mets the next day, the fans were calling for a sweep. But it would take a state of grace for that to happen. The series' final game was tied at four in the bottom of the ninth when Mark Grace came up. The pit. There's a drive way back. Way, might be. Cubs win. Cubs win. Cubs win. Grace hits a home run into the right field bleachers. Of victory. 
The man who had amazed the Amazing Mets was the man they called Amazing Grace. The runner-up in last year's Rookie of the Year voting had become the Cubs' leading hitter and a young star in the rise. He's an outstanding player. He's an outstanding hitter. He does anything on a baseball field that you ask him to do it, and I don't know what else a manager could ask for. Rarely has a player's name so well described his play both in the field and at the plate. Displaying remarkable grace, the young man is beginning to leave a mark on the game that may well prove amazing. On August 7th, a battle for first place began at Wrigley Field against the Expos. 39,000 fans were on hand for one of the biggest August games there in years. And starter Greg Maddox made it worth the wait. A high fly ball. Jerome Orton under the ball. Cubs win. Cubs win. The Cubs are in first place by a full game. The next day, there was more rookie swinging and more rookie singing. You sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game? <laughs> Well, swinging a little more freely was Jerome Walton, who was attempting to set a Cubs rookie record for hitting in consecutive games. There's a drive! Way back! It might be out of here! It is! Holy cow! The 19th game in a row is a home run! And the Cubs lead one to nothing! Exciting as it was, the Walton streak wasn't the only Cub streak going that day. Relief pitcher Les Lancaster hadn't allowed a run in 30 straight innings. But the Expos were threatening that streak and the Cub lead in the ninth inning. The pitch, a little tap. Cubs win, Cubs win. Lancaster, feel of the tap and through the grave. The Cubs have won the first two games of the series. And the Cubs now lead by two games. In the series finale, the Cubs were hoping to bid farewell to the Montreal Expos. In a winning cause, Ryan Sandberg homered for the third straight day in a streak that reached a team record tying five days. Jerome Walton extended his hitting streak to match his own number, and the Cubs won three to nothing. The Cubs hadn't had a pair of newcomers like Rookie of the Year Jerome Walton and runner-up Dwight Smith since the days of Ken Hubbs and Lou Brock. Walton's hitting streak was already news, but as he neared Ron Santos' Cubs record of 28 straight games, it became high drama. Breaker. The base hit! He got it! The 20th straight game for Jerome. No other Cub player. All those great hitters have had. Nobody ever hit in 29 straight games. A low looping liner. He's gonna beat it out! He does! The base hit! The 30th game in a row. The Jerome Walton has hit safely in. Holy cow! The streak assured Walton of a place in team history and the Rookie of the Year award. Another dramatic ninth inning rally in Cincinnati preserved Rick Sutcliffe's 13th win. Rick had been driven from the game in the eighth by a two-run home run that gave the Reds a 2-1 lead. The ace of the Cincinnati bullpen, John Franco, came in and in the ninth retired the first two Cub batters. Then, after loading the bases, he had to face the red-hot Jerome Walton. The Never Say Die Cubs had once again pulled one out, and they swept the Reds in Cincinnati for the first time since 1978. 
Step by step, the boys of Zimmer were converting skeptics, and the city was rocking. Companies are rocking all over town. There's a new sensation, and it's really coming down. North of Chicago, Waveland Avenue, there's magic in the air, a new point of view. It's been a long time now, too many years, too many losses and too many tears. But that's all over now, gonna give it to you straight. The companies are winning, and man, it feels great. Washington Smith, man, they got the speed with Sambrick and Braves. What more do we need? Balecki and Maddox firing away. Sutcliffe on the mound. What more can we say? Now mentions a man, what I'll think is his name. He comes in late to save that game. He throws Damon or Joe behind the plate. They call him safe before it gets too late. Cubs are rocking. Cubs are rocking. the back and then there's Andre Dawson. We're talking about the man that they call awesome. That's the law. And Les has the zeros and Popeye's the man that leads our hero. Yeah. Wayne, Harry, and Steve. Now, holy cow. The Cubbies are ready. Ready right now. Going all the way in this windy old town. The Cubbies are rocking. Gonna win that crowd. Cubbies are rocking. Cubbies are rocking. Damon Berryhill's strong first half of the season helped solidify Cub catching and put another potent bat in the lineup. But when the hard-throwing catcher suffered an injury that would keep him out of the stretch drive, rookies Joe Girardi and Rick Rona provided able backup at backstop. In football, it's called the House of Pain. And for the Cubs, the Astrodome has always been torturous. On August 18th, the Cubs jumped to a 5 to nothing lead there, but couldn't hold on. In the bottom of the eighth, with the Cubs still leading 5 to 3, Calvin Schiraldi let one slip. The bunch gets away! The run scores! And it's a 5-4 ball game. Then, after Houston tied the score in the ninth, manager Don Zimmer employed a rare strategy. With men on first and second and two out, pinch hitter Harry Spillman was intentionally walked to load the bases. Now, a pass ball, a wild pitch, a base on ball, and end the ball game. And that's exactly what happened. The game is over. He walked it. What started out to be a great cup victory winds up a painful defeat. Because this is a game you really kind of handle them. The pain continued for two more days with the Cubs suffering consecutive eight to four defeats. On top of that, the last game ended on a ninth inning grand slam off Mitch Williams. The following week, the Astros came to the House of Ivy and learned that turnabout is indeed fair play. But the first game started as painfully as the recent Astrodome experience. The Astros were scoring so often it took shorthand to keep track. And when Rafael Ramirez homered in the fifth, the score had reached an embarrassing nine to nothing. Wind's blowing out in Wrigley Field, you always know that no lead is safe. And we scored nine quick runs off of them. And I, when you're in that situation, you know it can happen the other way. Nine to nothing is a forfeit score. But the Cubs were not ready to toss in the towel just yet. Cubs! In the bottom of the sixth, the Cubs started chipping away at the formidable Houston lead. 
The lead was shrunk even further when Lloyd McClendon batted in the seventh. There's a drive in the center field. Way back. Might be. Hit it! A nine to four game. But the Astros looked like they had no intention of stopping at a mere nine runs. With Ramirez at second, Gerald Young slapped a hit to right, and Ramirez was headed home. Dwight Smith's throw to Joe Girardi nailed him, and the Astros would score no more. In the eighth, Ryan Sandberg got things cooking with an RBI single that scored Girardi. McClendon followed with a hit that drove in Jerome Walton to cut the lead to two runs. Mark Grace kept the roll going with a hit, and Sandberg scored, making the score 9-8. to eight. And McClendon was only 90 feet from tying the game. Dwight Smith hit a high fly to deep center, and McClendon crossed the plate to finally tie the game. Then, in the bottom of the 10th, Dwight Smith delivered the goods again. It was only the second time in the long history of the Cubs that they had overcome a 9 to nothing deficit. And it was one of the sweetest Cub victories ever. On the streets of Chicago, there was a genuine excitement about the Cubs' chances. After all, it was September, and the Cubs were in first place. But even in the bleachers, home of the ebullient bums, no one was giving anything away yet. Cubs fans always pray that the team doesn't fold in late August or early September as it has traditionally. This is wonderful fun, but Cubs fans have been through it so often. You have to consider in the last 17 years, this team has only been over 500 months. Chicago fans anticipate the worst, and, and the reason they do is because almost always that's what they've gotten. If the play's the thing, as Shakespeare wrote, then what of the double play? While the Cubs play at Wrigley, Shadow Cubs play at the Organic Theater in a revival of the popular play, Bleacher Bums. But if art imitates life, then the Cubs should not lose to the Cardinals night after night, as they do in the play. But if life imitates art, well, it might just be a case of drawing the wrong card. On September 8th, the Cardinals follow the script to perfection. But in the early acts, it looked like a laugher for the Cubs. Ryan Sandberg took the lead and delivered two home runs, including one big audience participation number. The Cubs had a 7-1 lead in the seventh. Then the plot twisted. Pedro Guerrero followed the stage version of the Cubs versus the Cardinals. His eighth inning homer capped a big Cardinal comeback and closed the Cubs show 11-8. Pedro enjoyed the bows, even if the audience wasn't calling for them. I think that game sort of kicked us in the butt, that game that I came in and blew. I mean, that's all it amounted to. The team played fine. We had a 7-1 to one lead against McGrain, and they come back and beat us on a Friday. And everybody kind of said, well, that's the end of the Cubs. Now the cards were just a half game out of first. And you can't shave it much closer than that. The newly acquired Luis Salazar came to bat in the next game with a man on and the score tied in the 10th. Line line. Not only had Salazar stroke the game winning hit in the 10th, but his RBI single in the 8th had tied the game. Cub fans were learning to like the decentralized hero system that seemed to provide a different hero for every victory. Tonight, it was Luis Salazar. Tomorrow, it might be, well, take your pick. Speed and power marked the rubber game of the series. Starting pitcher Steve Wilson struck out 10 batters, and four Cub pitchers combined to fan 18 Cardinals. 
the Cubs were held scoreless over the first five innings. But in the sixth, Dwight Smith batted with a man on. Smith drives one into left center field, tops it back on the track, that might go! After the disastrous production two days before, the Cubs were on the verge of actually taking a series. Mitch Williams came on to record his 30-second save, and the Cubs won 4-1. The boys of Zimmer had turned back yet another challenge, and they were now two and a half games ahead of the Cardinals. When the Cardinals left town, the Expos arrived and the Cubs were looking to extend their first place lead. In a tight game, the victory ended up being easy pickings. With two on and two out in the ninth, Mitch Williams caught Jeff Hewson leaning. Oh, they picked him off! They picked him off! The game's over! The game's over! They picked the big center off first place. The game is over! How about that? And Mitch Williams gets his 33rd save of the year. The next night, even the stars in the stands were outshone by a luminous Chicago Cub. That night, Ryan Sandberg, beloved by his fans, reached a new height in his career. There's a drive! Way back! It might be! It is! Hold on to Wendland Avenue! Holy cow! Sandberg, 30th home run of the year! In 1982, the Cubs acquired a promising new infielder. He's been there, gloriously there ever since. In getting Ryan Sandberg, the Cubs received a fellow who could not only field almost flawlessly, but also hit ferociously. Day in and day out, this guy is a very, very good baseball player. He, he's as good a second baseman as you'll ever see. He makes all the plays left and right. He makes all the double plays. He makes so few errors that when he makes one, you think the world's coming in on you. He hits for an average, he hits with power, he runs. He's a complete player, and I, I guess uh, being asked a question as many times as I've been asked, I would have to say that he's probably the best all-around second baseman that, I, that I've watched. And we've watched him again this year. He sets a record with 90 errorless games. He hits 30 home runs. He ties for the league lead in runs scored. Yes, it just might be time to anoint him one of the greatest of second basemen. Meanwhile, Greg Maddox was expansively enjoying the second half of the season. It was a welcome improvement on a rough second half in 1988. Last year, this guy was uh, almost a perfect pitcher the first half of the season. I don't know what his record was, maybe 15 and two or something. The second half, he didn't win as many games, and everybody said, well, he faltered in the second half. We're talking about a guy now 23 years old that's won uh, 35 games in two years. That's not too shabby. This year, he got off to a 1-5 start, but ended up winning 19 games and has become one of the best pitchers in the league. That's it, the ground ball. Sandberg, Cubs win. Cubs win. Greg Maddox is 15th victory of the year. He becomes the leading Cub pitcher. Almost two and a half million people passed through the Wrigley Field turnstiles in 1989, setting a record. Millions more watched on TV and listened on the radio. There's something about the Cubs and their fans that fascinates the rest of the country. The long-suffering routine may be part of it, but the sheer fun and beauty of a ball game at Wrigley Field is at the heart of it. We come to Wrigley Field, teams come and go, but Wrigley Field is constant. Uh, let me tell you the, 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 the reason why we love the Cubs. See, we can come to Wrigley Field and sit in a seat that our great-grandfather sat in, that our grandfather sat in, that our father sat in, that we're sitting in and our children's children will sit in. And we can watch the game of baseball, and just for those next three hours, nothing changes. Time stands still at Wrigley Field. While the business of baseball is conducted on the field, in and around Wrigley Field, various and assorted monkey business can be observed. All right, you put it in reverse. Here we go. Oops. 
<laughs> the painter is making sure he doesn't miss a single pitch. I'd like to be paying him by the hour, Harry, <laughs> to watch Cub baseball. Not everybody's watching a ball game. He's sent for anything that may happen. He can get into any door in Chicago. Look at those keys. He's still trying to get in there. There'll be some extensive damage to the two cars in front and back of him, but he's going to get in that spot. Now the question is, will he ever get out of it? Even the dogs are watching the Cubbies. That's because it's the dog days, Harry. Well, that's a funny sight. Got to keep them busy at the old ballpark. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> bang, bang, bang. The war is over, by the way. He's been flying around for a long time. Be careful, Bruce. Be <laughs> He's trying to chase it with his cap. There we go. There is the Spider-Man of Sheffield Avenue right there. And the finale. He did it. Tickets are tough to come by, and sometimes it's just good to be in the vicinity of the ballpark when you're watching games, waiting for fly balls to go over the fence. On September 21st, Andre Dawson sent one over the fence. Airman. There's a shot deep to left. Way back. Kiss it. Good. It's across the street, and the scramble is on. A three-run blast for Andre Dawson. And it looked like the mailman got it. Andre Dawson delivering the mail, and the mailman getting the baseball. I was riding down Waveland Avenue. I dropped the package off, and as I approached the corner where the ball was hit, I saw my friend. And he asked me, he said, what is you doing? I said, I come to catch a home run. And as soon as I said it, boom, he come the ball over the fence. I saw the mad scramble for it. I saw the ball kick loose, so I figured I had a chance to go get it. So I went for it. I kind of used the left forearm to keep them back, and I gave it a slight kick, and it bounced back to me. Not slow pitch, nor fleet one, nor room in right shall stay him from his appointed round tripper. What could be more beautiful than an autumn day at the ballpark when your team is in first place and all is right with the world? But the Pirates didn't think so, especially when Mark Grace drove in Marvell Wynn in the first inning. Mike Bilecki won his 17th game. Mitch Williams saved his 35th and the magic number was reduced to five. Saturday's game was a little chillier and a little closer. The score was tied 2-2 with Kurt Wilkerson on second in the bottom of the ninth. Mitch Webster was at the plate with a game on the line. Well, he's up there with a runner at second, one out in the ninth and a 2-2 tie. And he gets a base hit to right. Reed is charging. Here comes Wilkerson. The throw to the plate, he scores. The Cubs win it. Three to two. There was a salute to Harry Carey before the last regular season home game. Then the fans waved their team on to one more victory. Lines, well, they And I don't know who's happiest. The fans are the players. In a magical season, Chicago had grown to love these boys of Zimmer, and this was returned in kind as the Cubs thanked their fans. Everyone seemed certain there would be more home games soon. But first, there was a little matter called clinching to take care of. The Cubs had taken their four-game lead across the border to Montreal and hoped to nail the title down there before a final weekend series in St. Louis against the second-place Cardinals. On September 26th, with Greg Maddox on the mound going for his 19th win, the task of clinching seemed to be in capable hands. The Cubs got off on the right foot with a run in the second. Then in the sixth, Dwight Smith drilled a single into left. 
That drove in Ryan Sandberg for a 2 to nothing lead. When the scoreboard showed that the Cardinals had lost in Pittsburgh, the Cubs knew a victory here would wrap up the divisional title. But the Expos came back to tie the score at two in the bottom of the sixth. Meanwhile, in Chicago, Cub faithful gathered to offer some seventh inning stretch encouragement. Well, it was long distance, so it wasn't until the eighth inning that the rally vibes arrived. There he goes. There's a drive in the right field. He's on his way to third. There it's fumbled out. Here he comes. He's going to try to score. The save, save. The Cubs have taken the lead. Then, with perfect symmetry, the pennant race ended the same way it began with Mitch Williams coming in in relief to save a Cub victory. One ball, two strikes, a pitch. Hey, Cubs win the division! Cubs win the division! Cubs win the division! Then the long-awaited celebrations began all over Chicago and in one room in Montreal. This is unbelievable. We did it. 84, they said we were going to win. If we didn't win, we were going to choke. They said this team couldn't win, but we did. We just wanted to win this thing, so it didn't seem like we were back into anything. So we're the National League East champs, and they... oh, later. You know, when the Cardinals finally got beat, we were in the seventh inning with a two to nothing lead. And I said, well, I, at least that's, that's the best I've ever done in baseball was, with, uh, was a tie in Boston. And then when we finally won the game. <laughs> Cubs win! <laughs> Cubs win! In Chicago, the celebrants were drawn to Clark and Addison to stand before the ballpark that symbolizes the Chicago Cubs, the champions of the National League East. I wish we were there. I wish we were there to, to celebrate with them. Unfortunately, uh, we can't be there, but what a, what a city and what fans. So they deserve everything. They stuck behind us when we was losing. Now we're winning, and we came in this year with a so-so team, and. Now we stand on top so far, just hope we continue. And Cub fans, this for you. On October 4th, postseason play returned to Wrigley Field for the first time since 1984. It was the Cubs against the San Francisco Giants in a best of seven series. National League Manager of the Year, Don Zimmer, had led the Cubs to 93 victories. When they met Roger Craig's Giants, it was as champions of the National League East. It was a dream that had really come true. But on the first night of the playoffs, it turned into a nightmare. When it was finally over, the Clark Express had dropped a stunning 11-3 defeat off at Wrigley Field. The next day, it seemed like only the weather would prevail. But by game time, the rains relented. The Giants picked up where they had left off, with Brett Butler getting a leadoff walk. Mike Vilecki immediately served notice that things would be different tonight. Hey, 
then, in the beginning, the Giants starter was ex-Cub Rick Russell. And Big Daddy was welcomed back to Wrigley Field by Jerome Walton's leadoff single. Ryan Sandberg's triple drove him in for the first run. And then Mark Grace doubled to score Sandberg with the second run. And the Cubs' bats were blazing. By the time the light-hitting Bilecki came up, it was 3 to nothing with the bases loaded. Bilecki padded the lead with a single to center that scored Salazar and Dunstan. And now the Giants were staring at a 5 nothing deficit. Just for good measure, Jerome Walton got his second hit of the inning, driving in Joe Girardi. In an astounding first inning, the Cubs sent 12 men to the plate and scored a playoff record six runs. But it wouldn't be all offense for the Cubs on this big night. In the third, Jerome Walton robbed Robbie Thompson in center field with a fine rattling catch. In a night with many stars, the brightest was Mark Grace. In the sixth, he hit his second double of the game, this time with the bases loaded. It cleared the bases and ran the score to 9-2. to two. Les Lancaster came on in relief in the eighth, and though the Giants showed signs of life at the end of the game, the big lead stood up for an exhilarating 9-5 to five victory. It was a rare and glorious night in Chicago. A big win in a very big series, where it was now back to even. But there was only a brief moment to savor the big victory before packing the tools and heading to San Francisco for games three, four, and five at Candlestick Park. The San Francisco Bay Area was enjoying a warm October when the Cubs arrived. And, as everywhere, there were Cubs fans on the scene. We're an L.A.-based group of ex-Chicagoans living in Los Angeles. Go Cubs! Let's go Cubs! In Game 3, the Giants started Mike Lacoste in place of the injured Don Robinson, and he got into trouble early. A Lacoste wild pitch had moved Ryan Sandberg to third and Dwight Smith to second. Then Andre Dawson batted. There's a hit! One run in! Another runner on third! Dawson did it! And the Cubs are out in front, two to nothing! But the Giants came right back and scored three runs off Rick Sutcliffe in the first. Then with the Cubs leading 4-3 in the seventh, there were some pitching maneuvers. Les Lancaster came in with a man on first. There goes a the runner! The Giants went on to win the game 5-4, and the Cubs trailed in the series two games to one. It was a great ball game, great ball game tonight. Uh, you know, it had it had everything. It was well played by both teams, and and uh, you know they they got the last uh, they got the last big play, Robbie Thompson's homer, and uh, you know let's get them tomorrow. The series thus far had been a matchup not only of managers but of red hot first basemen. In the fifth inning of game four, the Cubs were trailing four to two, but Jerome Walton was on at first base. Signs were passed and signals were sent, but the message was clear. Mark Grace should continue to swing his hot bat. There's a line drive into right center field. Grace with another hit. The ball skips by Sheridan and will go all the way to the wall. Here comes Walton in to score. Grace on his way to third. There will not be a throw and the Cubs have the tying run at third. The Giants watched as Grace was followed to the plate by Andre Dawson. And a line drive into right center. That's in there for a base hit. That will go all the way to the wall. Grace scores to tie the game, and Dawson doubles. The Cubs had clawed back to tie the game. But in the Giants' half of the fifth, Matt Williams hit a two-run home run. The game ended 6-4, to four, and now the Cubs were down three games to one. These guys have played like heck all year. Uh, I mean, exceptional. They, they've done a great job. And all we can do tomorrow is come out here and try to win tomorrow to get back to Chicago. And that's what we'll try to do. A 
On Monday afternoon, the teams met again at Candlestick Park. Rick Russell was back on the mound for the Giants. And in the first inning, he gave up hits to Jerome Walton and Mark Grace. But unlike game two, a promising start did not amount to anything. Mike Bielecki, meanwhile, was turning in one of the best pitching performances of the playoffs. He kept the Giants off balance, off base, and off the scoreboard for most of the afternoon. But by the eighth inning, he had tired to the point of walking the bases loaded. Then, with the dangerous Will Clark coming up, Bielecki was lifted, and Mitch Williams came in. Then Clark, the man who had hurt the Cubs throughout the series, administered what appeared to be the coup de grace. Two runs scored, and the Giants led 3-1. to one. After Steve Bedrosian retired Sean Dunstan for the second out in the ninth, it appeared that the season was about to end. The Giants were ready to celebrate, and the Cubs were feeling the walls closing in. But this team hadn't quit all season, and with two outs, they staged a valiant comeback. Kurt Wilkerson singled to left to keep it alive. Then Mitch Webster singled to center and it looked like the Giants' champagne might stay corked. When Jerome Walton singled for the third straight two-out hit, the Cubs were only one run back. And it's a three-to-two ball game now. Three hits in a row. Oh, how this team has fought. You can feel proud of this Cub ball club fans. They never have given up. Images in defeat are poignant and revealing. The sadness and disappointment they convey are just seconds removed from the hope just felt. And so the dream ended a few games short of a miracle. But its end leaves no bitterness, for this is a young team. And the talent and poise they displayed under the pressure of this season will only mature in the next. The boys of Zimmer showed themselves as men to be reckoned with. They have already been taken into the hearts of their fans, and the Cubs have taken the fans into theirs. We just have a great admiration and respect and appreciation to the fans. That's, uh... Uh, there aren't many places in the world, I don't think, that have the type of loyalty that we have, and, and we have to thank all of the people that have been supporting us. These Cubs showed that they could taste the sweet moments of victory and that they are ready to drink from that cup again. They have earned a place in our hearts, even though this season's dream has ended. But dreams live on, both as memories and hopes.